Hi, I'm Gary Nall. Once again, I welcome you to our classroom on the air. Today I'm going to deal with an issue that impacts every single person on the planet to varying degrees. Stress. How to keep de-stressed in a highly stressed world. But let's take a journey back to the beginning of my career when I had an opportunity to meet some of the real pioneers, great minds. In fact, I would later interview over 500 of these individuals for a series called Conversations with Remarkable Minds. You can go to the Gary Nall Library and or to prn.live to the archives and you can find this collection. It's also on GaryNall.com. Because almost every one of these people now have passed. I was in my early 20s, and they were in their 60s, 70s. Um, and some of the greatest people who've contributed so much, some of the greatest writers like Norman Mailer and Tom Wolfe. But one of those individuals was considered the father of stress therapy. His name was Hans Selye, and he was a medical doctor, and we did many interviews together. And here's what was important. He said there's two types of stress that are going to impact the body, one constructively, one destructively. He said, when you're excited about going on a trip, to going to a concert, a movie, going out, um, maybe on a new date, uh, going someplace with your family or your loved ones, you feel excited by it. There's an excitement going to a concert, you feel excited about it. Even watching a coming attraction on a movie screen, and you think, Haven't, how many times you've done this? Hey, we're gonna have to see that when that comes out. And uh, there's an excitement, an anticipation of something positive. That means that you're releasing from your brain what are called endorphins. You're having more of dopamine hits. The more positive thoughts, the more dopamine hits the feel-good. In fact, those of us who run, we know that the longer we run, the more these endorphins, these natural feel-good hormones are released. And that's why we have a, a statement called the runner's high. Yeah, how you feeling? I'm, I'm feeling great. I'm on mile six. And you see this in the New York City Marathon, where initially you're very excited, and but about halfway through you realize you're in a race. Just calm down and uh, enjoy it. And suddenly these endorphins kick in, makes a big difference. In any case, um, this morning when I was out running in the fields, as I do with the dogs and a cat that loves to run with them and is faster than the two dogs and uh, plays with them, and just watching that in a reaction, the love where the dogs are licking the you know, cat's face and the cat's uh, loving them back, and the cat will hold the one little miniature Dotson and uh, roll around with it and then uh, let it get up and run. And, and I'm just smiling from ear to ear. Those are dopamine hits. When you're holding the hand of your loved one and looking in their eyes and thinking, how blessed am I in this moment to be with someone who accepts me for who I am, doesn't want to change me, uh, is not harping and, and nagging. You just feel good. In fact, just looking at someone, looking in their eyes, and if someone that you like, you feel good about that. Uh, it's the simple things of life, what are called on the hedonic scale of pleasure. We all deserve pleasure. We need pleasure. The pleasure of bonding, the pleasure of company, the pleasure of our friends and family, the pleasure of unique and original experiences, of breaking through of something we didn't know, now said, ah, that aha moment. Now I understand. Okay, and as we age and have more experiences, and we have that introspective voice saying, now do you understand? And you say, yeah, now I get it. But a good meal, in fact, in, I, I founded the first gourmet vegan restaurant in American history, the Fertile Earth, up on 108th and Broadway. And it was packed. The food came from the Fertile Earth Farm, the first organic teaching farm in New York State, where I also created the first food co-op in the United States. There was one that was in Berkeley, but when I went out there and got the dates in the early 1970s, I was six months ahead of them. In any case, grew everything organic, made the Essene breads. I had a kitchen that had the French brick ovens that stick out the back wall, and uh, you put the dough in, 
and this all were sprouts, fresh sprouts, and then you blend the sprouts up. You put your uh, seasoning in, your savory seasoning, or you might put diced uh, figs and dates and almonds and raisins in. You have two different types, and then you just put that kind of doughy material in there, close the door, and overnight the heat that is radiating up cooks it perfectly at a low temperature, so it's a living raw food of sprouts, gluten-free. It's phenomenal. And I used to bring that down as the bread that we gave in the restaurant. And we grew, we made miso, tempeh, tofu, we did it all ourselves. And uh, even making ice cream, the old fashioned way. Do you remember that? Uh, you have that wooden bucket, you fill it with ice, then you put, uh, you put your stainless steel cylinder with a crank handle and the blade that turns, and then you put your uh, whatever, we use goat's milk up there, but we also used almond milk before anyone was using almond milk. And that was an idea from a woman uh, who just passed this year, Roberta Addy. In any case, a brilliant chef. Uh, but then you put salt on the ice so it melts a certain way, and you're cranking, and then you look down there, boom, it's ready. Had honey from the beehives, had cherries and walnuts from the trees. You don't get fresher and better than that. People loved it. So we'd freeze that and then bring that in. That would be a dessert. Anyhow, we had a wonderful experience, and, uh, and I look forward to that. And so did the people. Nothing was rushed, and meals were inexpensive. We only had two different entrees, soup, salads, and desserts per day, but it changed almost every day. Did a lot of exploring, and that was my first restaurant. Then I did Gary's Place, which was enormously popular over on Columbus Avenue and 74th Street. We were packed. We had three seatings a night. We had the early bird at four, uh, another early bird at six to seven, then seven to eight, and then eight to nine. Actually, another one, nine to 11. And again, only two entrees, two soup salads, no big menus, and but that stuff was fresh. It was all organic. It was healthy, living foods. And it didn't serve alcohol, served juices, fresh made. So it's wonderful when you know you're doing something that other people are finding hedonic pleasure, meaning hedonic can also expand to hedonism. And at that level, you're happy to have a roof over your head, clothes on your back, food on the table, a family that loves you, even though at times you disagree on stuff, and friends that you hope will be there for the rest of your lives. And that's where most people today live. That's good doing things you like, reading a good book, doing things that are exciting, dopamine hits. You feel better. You're de-stressed, and that's the emphasis. Now, here's the other end of that. Here's what he called the deadly stressor. When you're distressed and where something is happening you cannot control, maybe the breakup of a relationship, maybe the loss of a friend, a pet, maybe the failure in your job, or being fired, and yet you've done good work. Maybe the uncertainty that the children you'd raised and thought you raised them right are now acting out, and you're thinking, what did I do wrong? You take the blame upon yourself. You assume that the child's now on drugs or fentanyl or heroin or cocaine or doing reckless and stupid things, that somehow you miss something in being a good parent, so you feel guilt and shame. All these things end up coalescing into creating a stressful reaction that is destructive, and suddenly something else happens at the biochemical level. And it's to being calm and joyful, which is healthy and builds our immune system, you're now anxious. Now, maybe you don't even know what you're anxious about. Maybe you just walk around with this kind of existential angst. You can't put your finger on it, but you don't feel right. Maybe a sense of foreboding. And so think of what that will do. How likely are you to go out and look for joy and happiness and fun and new friendships and relationships if you have this angst? What if I fail? What if I'm too old? What if life has passed me by? What if the best part of my life has passed me by? And I have this all the time. In fact, not long ago, I was in Atlanta and on the same trip, I also went over to West Palm Beach to do uh, specials for their PBS stations. 
And in both cases, this happened. In Atlanta, the uh, oh, Allison Steele, uh, Alicia Steele, who was the program director, a wonderful human being, very vivacious and uh, joyful, and she helped uh, co-host and raise the money for the station. She said, would I come down and talk with the people? Just to, you know, and I said, sure. She did it as a fundraiser, but when I walked in, uh, the morning after I'd done the evening program, the place was mobbed. I mean, they couldn't all fit in there, so I had her get me a portable mic so I could walk around and got up on chairs so people in the back could see and I could answer their questions. The interesting thing was most of the people, when asking questions, it had to do with things related to stress. Gary, does high blood pressure uh, in any way uh, come from stress? Uh, Gary, I've got an upset stomach. Every time I eat, I don't know why. Could that be because I'm, all, I'm, I'm going through a rough time right now emotionally? I'm in the midst of a divorce. Almost all the questions at some point came back to stress. So I did a whole two-hour lecture on stress, what to do about it, what causes it. And then the next day when I was in West Palm Beach, I'm in the airport ready to fly back to New York, and a guy comes over to me. He's probably in his early 40s, mid-40s. And he said, you're Gary Null. I said, yes. He said, I saw you last night on PBS here. It was really interesting. And in fact, I had a conversation with my wife afterwards because you were saying some stuff that made sense. And I said, uh, "And what are, you, what are you doing with the information? He said, oh, nothing yet. He said, but I've got a good memory, and I've seen you many times, including I live in Detroit, and you've been on Detroit, what, like seven or eight times with different programs, and they're always good. They tell me stuff I didn't know and remind me what I should do so I don't make mistakes. And I said, so why haven't you done anything about it? And he said, well, you know, I'm one of those people who like my comforts, and I like my comfort foods and, you know, my comfort drinks. And But he said, looking at you and seeing how healthy you are and how athletic you are, national champion athlete, world champion athlete, I know there's time. So as long as you stay healthy, I know there's time for me to get healthy. I hear that a lot, including from my own daily radio audience on, on PRN.live at noon. And I thought about that all the way back in the plane that day from, to New York. And so I asked my audience the same question the next day, which was a Monday. I said, how many of you listen every day and have for long periods of time? And first, I'd like to know, how long have you been living uh, that, and listening to this program? And I got all these answers. Oh, I've been listening 20 years, 30 years. Okay. How many heard me back when I first started radio on, on WHBO? And I got people back then, two people called. Why? Well, I, I used to listen all, every day. And then when you went to WMCA, and then when you went to ABC Network on Saturdays and WABC on Sunday nights, WBAI for the last, you know, 40 years. It's actually 47 years now. And so then I asked the second question. How many of you applied the information? How many use it? It was like the phone was dead. No calls. And finally, a woman calls in, and she says, my name is uh, Catsby, and I'm 85, Gary, and I feel phenomenal. And she says this, she says, my husband and I have great sex, and he's older than me, and we can only do that because we follow a healthy lifestyle. What you suggest we do, we try it, and if it works, we keep doing it, and it works. She said, I got the right weight, I have, my mind is sharp as a tack. I haven't lost my memory. I have no diseases. She says, yeah. She says, maybe other people think that somehow they can do it in the future, but I've been doing it ever since I listened to you. Okay. She's still around. She is almost 100. Still active, sharp as a tack. And that's important to understand. So now, 
And this is part of this stress at issue. Now I ask people, before you make any decision in life, no matter what it is, because it's the little decisions that are wrong that end up causing you problems because they accumulate. Don't overlook red flags. If you see something in someone's behavior that's not right, diplomatically, without drama, call it out. If someone says something to you that is not right, no matter if it's an employer or a friend or family member, stop and say, hold on a second. I would never speak to you with such disrespect or condescension. Uh, so I do not allow people to speak to me disrespectfully. So I do not intend to carry on any more conversation. I'm not going to raise my voice. I'm not going to feel bad about being a good person. And you're not going to make me feel that somehow I should punish myself when you've weaponized your words against me. Because if you select a word, call me stupid, uh, for example, that's your impression of me and you want to hurt me. You want me to feel that I'm stupid. I'm not going to buy into that. That alone, just saying, whatever you feel about me, that's your feelings. I know who I am. I know the reality of my life. I'm a good person. I'm a kind person. I'm not stupid. I'm not saying I'm a genius, but I'm not stupid. And so then associate with people who support that position, who will honor that. And look at what we do just the opposite. Now that is de-stressing because you're not personalizing personal attacks. But we do just the opposite. We start to feel bad when someone raises their voice and or curses us or says something intentionally demeaning. We personalize it as if, oh wow, I didn't know I was all those bad things. Well, what if you're not? And if you did something that was wrong, then just say, you know something, explain to me without being angry, keep your voice down, explain to me what I did that you feel was wrong, give me your impression, and if I did, I'll apologize. I have no problem with that. And then let the person tell you, well, you did this and you did that. I'll give you a good example. There was a, uh, a mother taking care of her son who graduated from college three years ago and the son was still living at home because he couldn't find a job because he didn't major in anything that was going to be you know out there as a job waiting so he had all this student debt and the mother was having to pay his student debt and she was divorced and she had to work hard and one day when she came home uh, she was so tired that uh, she ordered some food and brought it home. And he came downstairs and he was angry at her. What's this? You always make, you know, uh, a complete meal. Uh, I'm not going to eat this crap. And she said to him, sit down for a moment. Tell me what you're angry about. Well, I have a certain expectation, right? And she's okay. Did you work today, outside of being on your computer all day long, as you do every day, did you even think, well, I'm not going to get a job if I don't like the job? And that's generational, by the way, right now. Good luck trying to find a young person who's willing to work and be conscious. What most young people lack, they lack discipline. They lack innate intelligence. They lack an awareness of the cause and effect of the quality of the work they do upon others. There's no loyalty, and uh, they're terrible with uh, timeliness, and they expect to be rewarded even if they haven't done anything to deserve the reward. <clears throat> That's an entire generation. Now, within that, there are people who did get the right education and the right parenting, whether from two people, ideally, or from one, as a result of having good input and knowing what is appropriate and inappropriate behavior, how to communicate correctly and incorrectly, how to honor your word, how to look at problems and then see solutions and get ahead of the problem by creating the solution before you manifest the problem. And so the mother then said, because we had this conversation uh, when the mother who is in a health support group explained this, 
This is her big stressor. This is why her blood pressure is high, her heart rate is high, uh, and she's she's really in pain. But she never shares this with anyone. So she listens to what their son said, and then she said, I can't be angry at you because I allowed you to become what you've be, become, a selfish, self-absorbed, narcissistic brat. So here's the deal. You not once have done your laundry, cleaned the house, bought food, or even if I give you money, went to shop for food. You haven't cleaned up afterwards. So I work all day. I buy the food. I prepare it. Uh, you eat it. I clean up afterwards. I then clean up the house. I do your laundry. I take the dog out because you've only taken out once in the morning and it's been here all day long. And then I put the wash in the laundry and the laundry into the dryer. And then I go in and I collapse on the bed exhausted. Not once have you said, Mom, you know, you're doing too much. Let me help. This is your whole generation. And I'm sick of it. And quite frankly, I'm sick of you. And I've just borne all this unnecessary stress. You don't know it. I'm on two medications because my blood pressure is so damn high. Because it's chronic stress. And chronic stress raises cortisol levels. And I can't bring them down because I don't know what the future is. And if this is the future, having a son that is so self-absorbed, so selfish, so self-righteous, and this is how you treat your mother, then I don't see what the world's going to be for you if I should die. Because you would stay here your whole life and be taken care of. There's a time when you grow up. And the millennial generation has not grown up. And your generation sure as hell hasn't grown up and won't. Because it's too late. It's too late. So the son just went ballistic and uh, went in his room, according to her, and was throwing stuff all over the place. And so the mother did something that was unique. Uh, the next day, uh, she called in and said she wouldn't be able to work that day in the office. Instead, she packed up all of her clothes and told the landlord that she was moving and she would pay the rent till the end of the month. And she left to start her life over. And she had to separate herself. Her son had food and uh, she put some money on the table and says, you're on your own. And he would be there for a month where the mother had done all this. You almost never see this happening. Never. What you do see is the mother will end up with a heart attack or a stroke and die. And nobody will think, did I cause that? No, not younger people. They just can't do anything that looks at the reality of the life that they've been living in. Now, whether they were spoiled rotten and a close friend of mine spoiled his son so bad and he was part of the Hollywood community, rich, famous, and the son never had to work for anything, never appreciated anything. They could just go in, well, let's go shopping today. Do you need it? Don't need it. But I'm in the store, might as well buy something. Let's say he buys a $10,000 watch. This son blew $7 million in two years. I know that for a fact because I kept saying, why are you allowing this? Well, because, and then he went into why he felt the son would learn some lesson. He suffers some guilt and shame. The son has learned nothing. I've tried to counsel the son. Learn nothing. He's uh, 31 years old and won't do anything for himself. He just asked his dad yesterday, Dad, I want to go uh, to Monaco. I'd like for you to pay for a nice suite and a, the best hotel and a driver, etc., and some new clothes I'm going to need because I want to hang out with the rich there and so maybe they'll be interested in the things I'm creating. I said, I hope you're not going to pay for this. You saw what happened when he just returned from Europe. Nothing. You just blew all that money. $500,000. Now, mind you, he's no longer a billionaire. He's not even a multimillionaire. So he's down to where he's 85 years of age and stressed constantly. And blood pressure up. All these markers in the body are up. Homocysteine levels. And yet he's very aware of health. But unfortunately, he's not alone. A lot of wealthy and professional parents 
they raise their children in a bubble to where it's normal to, you're 16. Let's have a party for you, a sweet 16 party. Uh, what would you like? Well, I want Rod Stewart to come and sing, okay, that's $2 million, whatever it is. Uh, it's insane. This is the worst generation of parenting in American history. The worst. I blame this on the parents. Uh, so many, not all parents, not all by any means. A lot of parents do the best they can, and they can't compete with the influence of the outside world upon the stimulation, the challenges, the uh, opportunities that the peers provide them. What teacher can compete in keeping a student's attention in the classroom when they have a world of distraction on the Internet, on their iPhones? So we have things happening that even the best teacher, the best parents, single or double parent, cannot control the outcome. That creates angst and existential angst. That creates the cortisol going up. That creates epinephrine, norepinephrine, catecholamines, adrenaline, uh, glucose, all going up, all bad. All that can lead to a heart attack or stroke like that. So I'm sharing this extended insight to show you that we're dealing with a lot of problems. So that woman has gone on with her life. I'll tell you one other story, true story. This goes back further, but it's the same phenomena. It was, uh, I work late at night uh, in my office in New York. Generally, I go in at 10 o'clock because I want to go out and go to concerts and movies and plays with my friends. I don't, I'm refusing to live my life out of balance. I can't work nonstop 20 hours a day, and I won't because then I would be stressed. So I take my time every day after my radio show in New York to go over, walk over to Central Park, walk through Central Park, go to the museums, which are some of the finest museums in the world, and just enjoy sitting in front of a Thomas Cole Hudson Valley painter from the 19th century, or maybe a Frederick Lewis Church painting, uh, looking at some of the great sculptures, uh, just enjoying nature, taking my time and having a nice, quiet lunch in a cafe vegan cafe. I put that into my day. I make sure that happens. I put my friends and family in my day to make sure that happens. My, my, uh, my friends, because my family only have one brother left and a daughter. That's it. And, uh, but I make sure that whatever time they need, it's there. Even just to go for a walk or go to a concert. And then I come back and I counsel people. Well, one night, it was a Friday night, and I had finished my last person at around 1.30, and it was pouring rain outside. I remember going downstairs and going out and hailing a cab so the person wouldn't get wet. And uh, I went, as I was going back in, I hear this person say, Gary, I turned around, there's this woman soaking wet. And she said, do you have any time? I said, sure, come on in. So we went up to my office. And I looked at her. She looked like she was in her late 30s. Uh, she looked fit. And I said, what's wrong? How can I help you? And she said, well, she said, uh, I found out today that my children, my two teenage children, have sided with their father. And uh, all of our friends have sided with my husband. And... I've been living a lie, and I didn't know it until today. Well, her husband, she told me, was a very well-known and popular physician on Long Island, and uh, she was a nurse, and she was a nurse in his office in the hospital, and they had two children, a daughter and a son, and uh, she thought she had the I ideal marriage and ideal family. She had a large group of friends, and she was always going to benefits and, and auctions for charities. Um, and then she found out that uh, her husband had been having an affair. And not only did she find out about it, but her husband said, I'm going to be seeking a divorce, and I'm going to take the kids with me. She says, no. And he said, then why don't you talk with the, the, the kids? So she did, and they didn't want to be with her. So then she started to talk that day with her friends, and they were siding with it. Well, you know, 
you know, your husband's the one that's famous and invited. And so we want to keep kind of a, a civil discourse so um, we're not going to be able to see you because we can't have you in the friendship and your husband simultaneously. That doesn't work out here, as you well know. And she realized for the first time she had been living a lie. She did not have unconditional love. Some, and her kids got so used to being spoiled that that spoiling came from the father, not from the mother. The mother enabled it, but the father was making the money and was well known and you know, was the center of attention everywhere. And so the children didn't want that gravy train to stop. All those special gifts and all that. Well, Dad, I want to go this year to Sweden over the summer. No problem. Go ahead. Never question about who's going to pay the bills. He did. So then she felt just totally distressed. And she said that she cried for hours and she didn't know what to do. And she said, I I listened to you on the radio and I know that you work at night and I just tried to come in here and uh, I I don't know what to do. I said, you're very fortunate. She looked at me and she said, I'm fortunate? How am I fortunate? I'm middle-aged and I have no friends. I have no husband. I have no children at this moment. I said, good for you. She said, what's good about it? I said, because now you don't have to live with the lie that you had something you didn't have. You had the illusion of having this wonderful family and, and children and friends, but you didn't in reality, did you? No. I said, so smile and rejoice. You're free. You're free now to select people to put into your life who will honor you for who you are. I said, what is your number one passion that you never have time for? She said, art. I'm always too busy. I mean, I I work 20 hours a day between taking care of the kids. And I said, taking care of the kids are teenagers, right? Yeah, yeah. I said, so you, you what? You do their laundry? Yeah. Why can't they do their own? Well, and you then clean the house? Yes. And you take care of the dogs that they wanted as puppies that didn't have time for as they grew up? Yeah. And you have to do all the shopping? Yes. Plus you have to be a nurse in the hospital and your doctor, uh, husband's office? Yes. So when did anyone look after your needs? And she thought, she was silent, she said, they haven't. When was the last time your children came up and hugged you and says, Mom, you do more than enough for us. Stop doing it. We can do it for ourselves. They've never done that. Okay, so you can learn a lesson about enabling people. The more independent a person becomes and able to take care of themselves, the healthier that person will be. The more the people expect other people to do something for them, the weaker that person will be. And in the real world, you never know when you got to do things on your own. Okay, so then I said, the worst thing we can do is believe in something that's not real. And how many relationships were not real relationships? People were together because others expect them to stay together, stay married, when long ago they should have said, I'm not blaming you, you shouldn't blame me, we're just not right for each other. We have different thoughts, different energies. Let us peacefully go on our way so you can have the life you deserve and I can have the life I deserve. We don't do that. We hold on, we ruminate on What went wrong? What went wrong? What did I do wrong? And that keeps your cortisol level up, stress up, and free radicals really destroying your cells. You literally can take 10, 20 years off your lifespan by stressing. So, I make a call, 2 o'clock in the morning now, and I make a call to a friend of mine who's an artist down the village. Uh, Not a famous artist, but well-known. And uh, I said... This person was in my running club, and I'd work with them, help make them an elite, elite athlete. They won a lot of awards. And I said, look. And this person was up anyhow. And I said, uh, I've got a situation here. And I put him on the phone. And I said, this person would like to be an artist. Well, you're a phenomenal artist, and that's how you make your living and your reputation. Could you give this person some guidance? He said, yeah, have her, have her come down. 
Okay. When? Now. <laughs> so I said, do you have any money? She said, yeah, I've got credit cards. And I've, I've got some cash. He hasn't stopped that yet, and he won't until our divorce is over. I said, well, then you go down to the village, and you let one of the finest artists in the village, in the East Village, the Lower East Side, that's the mecca of art in New York, is vibrant, it thrives. The, the intelligence, the insight of these artists is a phenomenon. And she did. Jump ahead. Mind you, I'm seeing people every day. Jump ahead. Nine months. Nine months, she comes to the running club that I would do every, since 19, um, let me see, 1975, July 4th, I've held a, when I'm in New York, which is most of the time, except now when I'm down here in Florida, I would hold a running and walking club free to teach people how to do the New York City Marathon, get in the shape. Tens of thousands have gotten in the marathon because of, and finished the marathon. She shows up, and she's just smiling ear to ear. And uh, so they wanted a quick divorce. The husband did fine because he wanted to marry his, uh, his mistress. Fine. And she got a nice settlement. So she bought a whole studio in, in Soho. And she had everything she needed. She owned it. It was hers. Um, and that entire time, her children never called her, didn't want to speak to her, didn't want to see her. She had gone to art school. She was in art school. Uh, she was starting to do her art. She had a whole, whole new group of friends. Um, and she was happy as can be. And she said, I just want to thank you because I thought my world was over when I came in that night. And my whole way in on the train, I was just, I was just devastated. She says, but I'm healthy, I'm happy, I'm being responsible to myself but no one else. And she said, I didn't understand in the moment when you said you're free because you're no, lo no longer living a lie, what that meant, now I do. Well, that was 22 years ago. Today, that person is a very successful artist, actually teaches art, and has no financial problems, and has loving friends, and is in a loving relationship. Now think of the difference. Good stress that allows the endorphins, waking up in the morning with a smile on your face, being around people and circumstances that keep you in balance. When you eat healthy food, you're in balance. When you drink healthy juices, you're in balance. When you read good books, nonfiction books about history and cultures, you're in balance. When you look for the independent candidate to vote for and not one of the dancing clowns that run for office, you're in balance. When you commit yourself to no longer allowing negative thoughts and negative things into your body and mind, you're in balance. When you tell the truth, even if there's a consequence, you're in balance. Wouldn't you rather have someone who accepts you for telling the truth than lying to a person and they accept you because of the lie? Wouldn't you rather deal with your dark side, which is always limiting you, like insecurity and fear? And one of the worst things is expecting things to go back the way they were. I'm gonna, I, want, I want something to change. I want to get back to the way it was. I just had a conversation with another friend, a long-term friend, 30 years, 30 more almost 40 years, whose family rejected her. Literally, she loved her family. But they gave everything, all the assets of the family, which is millions and millions of dollars, and all control to the brother, not to her or her sister. And she feels utter contempt because she spent everything she did was for her family. Every conversation, well, I'm with my dad, I'm with my uncle, blah, blah, blah. And now she wants to recreate uh, that environment. She wants everything to be okay again. And I said, it's not going to be okay again. You're dragging around a dead dog. Doesn't matter how you loved it when it was alive, it's dead. You bury the past, you let it go. Because if you don't, it's not going to come back. The people who betrayed you, the friends and family, who sided with the, your, your father and your brother are not going to come back and say, you know, we made a mistake. We, we put all of our energy in your brother instead of you. So this person has to get rid of that 
idea that somehow she can take a thousand pieces of a broken vase and by wishing it in some euphoric mindset with pixie dust, it's all going to come back. It doesn't. Well, we'll circle back around and we'll make it right. You'll never make it right. What is made wrong is wrong. We have a fetish in this country about trying to trying to justify staying in a negative position, a stressed position, a victim mindset. Now she she's living a victimization. And that's unfortunate because she's a very nice person. She's a very gentle person. She just didn't realize how brutal her own family was. The red signs were there. She should have saw it. She chose not to. I said, now, do something I call living your life in reverse. Turn around and look at all the things in detail, even the minutiae, that led up to that situation where your brother has total control of the family and you have none. You're out. For why? What? That had nothing to do with you, had to do with your brother and his excessive needs and your father who didn't appreciate you even though you helped him at every level growing up. So now say, thank goodness I understand how, self, how selfish people can be. But that's their reality. I can't change their reality. So stop personalizing your grief. Let go of it, because if you can't let go of shame and guilt and fear and insecurity and uncertainty, that's as far as you're ever going to go in life. You'll never grow beyond that. So let it go. Let it go and be happy about today. If nothing else, let it be happy. Be happy because you no longer are going to be a victim. Okay? And all those things you chose not to look at, look at it. Look at the little things. Because if we don't deal with the little things, they're only going to grow and metastasize. And then one day we think, well, how did, how did I get 300 pounds? How do I have heart disease? Because of the little things you chose to think weren't important. Everything is important in time. So, mindful meditation. Being mindful. Allowing no negative thoughts in. No, I'm not going to have that thought in. And focus upon your ideals. And that means repurposing your energy. Look at your goal and say, what do I have to do? What support system do I have to have? What energy do I have to apply in order to get to that goal? And then maintain your balance in getting there. The average person, they just want the goal. They want the golden ring. They want to climb this ladder of success. And then one day they get there, and there's no there there. It was all an illusion on illusion. And that's what much of people are finding out today. So think about this, all right? You're either in happy stress, hedonic stress, or you're way over here in extreme hedonism, where you'll say anything, do anything, do any drug, do anything, anything decadent, just so you can say you're doing whatever you want to do. Well, there's a consequence to that when it's irresponsible and unhealthy. All right? Think on these things. You have resources now. Go to GaryAndAll.com. Use all the resources that I have there. Over 100 documentaries, over 100 different books, and nearly 1,000 articles. And then PRN.live for all the daily information on radio. So you've got a lot of information that you can process in ways that you find are useful. But always maintain your sense of self. Don't put anyone else in the driver's seat. Don't be in the back seat. Get in the driver's seat. Be the architect of your own existence. Thank you for taking this time, and have a nice day. Are you tired of closed-minded programming? Well, look no further than PRN.Live, the home for progressive voices.